it's the first class i didn't wanted you to get burdened with everything so i have prepared the notes combining sop as well as illustrated class illustrated textbook as well and i have uh, tried to add whatever was there in the guidelines okay so let's start with it bismillahir rahmanir rahim okay so we all know the endocrine glands yeah this is just a random picture as i said that i will assume we don't know much so that's why i'm starting from very basic if you guys think it's not necessary or whatever just bear with me let others maybe somebody is not comfortable in speaking so we'll just tell so first is hypothalamus we know then we have pituitary which contains anti which is anterior pituitary posterior pituitary pineal gland this is very very important you know pineal gland uh this secrets melanocyte this is one of the questions in recalls otherwise this is like i used to think like this is not a important one but pineal gland secrets melanocyte next is thyroid gland parathyroid gland then we have pancreas then we have adrenal glands some hormones are also secreted from the ovary from testes and from the placenta so these are the endocrine glands in our system okay okay let's so uh these are the endocrine glands and the hormone now don't get worried by seeing the large uh, table you don't need to uh look at this target tissue and response this is not needed just look at the gland and hormone okay so the first gland is the pituitary gland so there is anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary we all know that anterior pituitary secretes six hormones right growth hormone growth hormone thyroid stimulating hormone adrenocorticotropic hormone melanocyte stimulating hormone then luteinizing hormone follicle stimulating and prolactin and the posterior pituitary has two hormones anti diuretic hormone or known as vasopressin or adh and oxytocin then we have thyroid gland this is very common we know this is thyroxine t3 t4 and calcitonin these are the hormones secreted by the thyroid gland okay anywhere you have doubt you can ask me without hesitation and actually i cannot see the message bar at this moment since i am sharing screen so just ask without any hesitation you are paying for it and you want to enjoy it okay so we we'll go to the next slide now we have the parathyroid gland so the parathyroid gland secretes parathormone or parathyroid hormone it is denoted by pth okay that is called parathormone next one is adrenal medulla now the adrenal gland it is also it is known as suprarenal gland because it is situated above the kidney it has two parts one is adrenal cortex another one is adrenal medulla now the adrenal cortex secretes aldosterone cortisol and adrenal androgens adrenal and androgen means testosterone sex hormone and adrenal medulla secretes catecholamine now what are catecholamine epinephrine and norepinephrine okay so just uh, remember adrenal cortex and adrenal medulla next is pancreas we know pancreas secrete insulin insulin is secreted by the beta cell of the pancreas this is one of the questions in recall then we have glucagon glucagon is secreted by the alpha cell then there is delta cell there is pancreatic polypeptide there are so many cells among them this two you have to know insulin and glucagon secreted by the pancreas okay next we have from the testes uh, we have testosterone from the lady cells of the testes from the ovaries estrogen and progesterone from the uterus and ovaries and in frame tissue prostaglandins are secreted now prostaglandin is not always considered a hormone but it does even like vitamin d vitamin d has some for hormonal action so that is the reason prostaglandin just like vitamin d has some hormonal action that is why it is mentioned here next we, one we have thymus it is hardly mentioned anywhere thymus and it uh, releases thymosin it's not that important so you have to remember these all the glands okay that endocrine gland and what are the hormones secreted by them this is very basic thing that we needed to start with okay any doubt still here you want me to repeat anything No. 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 It's fine. Okay. Now let us move. Now you know. So these are the hormones we studied from the gland releases hormones. Now these hormones they have certain types. Now the types can be depending on their chemical structure 
or depending on their mechanism of action. Now, first we'll study depending on their chemical structure. Now, depending on the chemical structure, they are divided into amide hormones. First one, amine hormones, they are catecholamine, means epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine. So these are the hormones secreted by the adrenal medulla. These are all amine hormones or known as amide. Next, we have peptide hormone. They are growth hormone, insulin, and thyroid hormone. These are peptide. Next, we have steroid hormone. Basically, steroid hormone are the sex hormones that is estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, along with aldosterone and cortisol. Okay, that means aldosterone, cortisol, and testosterone. These three are secreted by adrenal cortex. So you can say steroid hormones are secreted by adrenal cortex plus estrogen and progesterone. Glycoprotein hormones, they're glycoprotein in nature. The chemical nature is glycoprotein. They are types of glycoprotein, luteinizing, follicle stimulating, and thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, after seeing this table, you might think, okay, this is really hard. This is hard to remember. Trust me, even now, I haven't memorized everything here. Okay, I find it really hard. And after once in a while, I go and I look back at this table. I go and I look back at this table. Just a minute. Give me a minute, please. It's in my pink bag. Okay. So just don't worry, you might forget it. This is like really, you know, this are a bit complicated stuff. Not so complicated, just hard to remember. So you have to do it like the finishing frequently, okay? Now we have types of hormone depending on the mechanism of action. So some hormones, they act by... So basically, I'll just tell you the basic idea is that the hormones always bind to a receptor. And after binding to receptor, they, they go to the site of action. So some hormones have their receptor in the cytoplasm. Some hormones have their receptor in the nucleus. For example, steroid hormone, sorry. Steroid hormone has their receptors in the nu nucleus. I mean, they're sorry, function is in the nucleus. So steroid hormone, what they will do is that, this we are giving a steroid hormone. Example of steroid hormone is aldosterone, cortisol, testosterone. What they will do is that for them to, them to act on the body, they will enter into the cell. In the cytoplasm of the cell, they will bind to the steroid receptor and then they will go to the nucleus and then exert their response, whatever response by creating certain proteins, okay? So this is important. Steroid hormone has the receptors in the nucleus. Now we have the peptide hormones. The peptide hormones, they have the receptor in the cell membrane itself. And they work, they bind by, uh, they work by binding to the receptor in the cell membrane and then they move to the nucleus and then they do the uh, they do their work. So on the basis of this, we can say that steroid hormones are like they work on the nucleus and the cytoplasmic receptors, they have cytoplasmic receptors and peptide hormone, they have receptor on the plasma membrane. And there is another hormone that is thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone have the receptors in the nucleus. I couldn't get a perfect picture of that, so I have decided to say it. So this, this is the two most important things that is asked, that steroid hormone, where is the receptor? Steroid hormone, you can see the receptor is in the cytoplasm, and peptide hormone, you can see receptor is in the cell membrane. Okay, is this clear with everybody? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I'll move. So there comes our favorite topic, diabetes mellitus. As I said that, about one third of endocrine system is diabetes mellitus. You cannot, you cannot go without this actually. This is like so important and this is so vast, so vast. But at the same time, there are very few things you need to remember. You don't have to worry because inshallah after this class, it will be very easy for you. So basically what is diabetes mellitus? We know basically diabetes mellitus means there is some deficiency of insulin. Okay, either the insulin receptor is pre, uh, def, uh, like resistance or the beta cells of the pancreas are not able to produce insulin or what happens, there is some antibody against insulin is produced. So this is the basic issue in diabetes mellitus. Now, wh what is wrong if insulin is not produced? Now, when insulin is not produced, the body will not be able to regulate the blood glucose. So what will happen when there is absence of insulin, it will lead to hyperglycemia. 
and hyperglycemic state persistent hyperglycemic state leads to diabetes mellitus okay now in this uh, for the mrcpch you don't have to study the adult diabetes mellitus but what is most important is type 1 and type 2 so among these two types type 1 is very common in children and here we are mostly dealing with type 1 diabetes mellitus i have also mentioned about type 2 we'll study that later but the most important thing for us here first is type 1 diabetes mellitus now we all have studied adult diabetes mellitus right that is type 2 what is the defect there there is some insulin resistance or the pancreatic beta cell destruction but in case of type 1 diabetes mellitus you know what is the issue okay this is a hla association this is the genetic association okay you have to mug mug this up you have to just rectify this dr3 dr5 dr4 i'll come to this later now what is the pathogenesis in case of diabetes mellitus here autoimmune it is a autoimmune disorder due to presence of glutamic acid decarboxylase antibody against beta cell of the pancreas so it causes destruction of the beta cell so no insulin is produced that leads to hyperglycemia and diabetes mellitus okay so you understand the pathogenesis here is the pre presence of the gad antibody this is very important in case of type 1 the pathogenesis here is glutamic acid decarboxylase antibody but in case of type 2 that is not the case so type 1 diabetes mellitus is basically autoimmune disease due to presence of gad antibody okay is this clear yes okay so how the child will present so for type 2 we know that there will be a long history usually but in case of type 1 diabetes mellitus the child will have very short history almost like few weeks he'll say that i have polyuria polydipsia there will be history of weight loss since there is polyuria so there will lead to dehydration okay most children with type 1 diabetes may present with features of dk that is abdominal pain vomiting dehydration reduced consciousness acidosis cosmor breathing so some children with diabetic uh diabetes mellitus type 1 type 1 dm they don't present with normal symptoms they may remain undiagnosed and suddenly one day they'll present with all features of dk uh did you did you all watch the dk video demo video that i posted yes i did okay i hope everybody has watched because i am not going to take class for that i will <laughs> don't worry but it will be easier actually and uh, to for you to understand so dka is diabetic ketoacidosis okay we'll study more about that in the next topic so the child has diabetes but remain undiagnosed or maybe diagnosed they'll present with abdominal pain there is vomiting dehydration reduced consciousness acidosis ka small breathing diabetic ketoacidosis the diabetic means they will be hyperglycemia and there will be ketone body formation so type 1 children usually they'll present with very short history with polyuria polydipsia then there is a uh, weight loss dehydration or directly they'll present as dk now what will you do what were the investigation that you have to do so a child has come to you with polyuria polydipsia weight loss dehydration or maybe the child has come in a very critical condition with abdominal pain vomiting and you just check the blood sugar and you see it is 30 or 40 so the blood sugar is high and ketone is high the blood ketones urinary ketones are high so you have to think okay it is diabetes you are suspecting it is diabetes mellitus now if it is type 1 diabetes mellitus we normally go for the random blood sugar the fasting blood sugar is not very reliable for type 1 diabetes mellitus okay the random blood sugar is more reliable for this so the random blood sugar will be more than 11.1 millimole per liter so and also another diagnostic factor is that presence of all the symptoms that is polyuria polydipsia weight loss dehydration plus if the fasting blood sugar is more than 7 millimole then we can consider it okay presence of gad antibody so we look for antibody gad antibody if it is present we confirm it hba1c so what is hba1c this is the glycosylated hemoglobin so this usually gives a picture about about uh, the blood sugar in your body for the last about 8 weeks 8 to 10 weeks so suppose some patients what what they do is that they'll come to you and they'll uh, their blood sugar will be normal or slightly increased but when you see the hba1c 
sorry, HbA1c, you will see that it is very high. That is more than 6.5. That means they have not been having a good control of the diabetes for the past few weeks. So we can consider that. But you know, HbA1c will not give a correct value in a child with hemolytic disease. So we go for OGTT. So what happens is that in case of type 1 diabetes mellitus, first we have to go for RBS. Then we go for the presence of GAD antibody. Then we go for HbA1c to see the status. But if the child is presenting with uh, hemolytic disease, so this is glycosylated hemoglobin, okay, HbA1c meaning. So since the child has hemolytic disease, such as sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, autoimmune hemolytic disorder, in this case, his RBC is already constantly breaking with a span of two to three days. Okay, or max you say five days, seven days. So of course, that will not show you the correct amount of HbA1c. It will easily be broken. So this is not reliable. If the child is having any kind of hemolytic disorder, we have to take the history. So the HbA1c will not be available. Then we'll go for OGTT. But OGTT is actually not preferred, okay, for uh, type 1 diabetes mellitus. It is mainly for adults and for type 2. Next one is we'll screen for some associated autoimmune disease. Now, this is so common. You will hear this all the time. All the autoimmune disorders, they have common associations with other disorders. And this is so important for our exam. Uh, it took me some time to learn it. Okay. So if a child has type 1 diabetes mellitus, it is very likely for him to even have celiac disease hypothyroidism okay this is very common for him to have this whereas if the child has type 2 diabetes mellitus then he can have Addison's disease it's like you know uh, common associations of disease you will learn this inshallah as we go chapter by chapter and everything so these things are going to be very easy for you I just learned this recently okay so no worries so we'll Hmm. So we'll screen for the associated. So we see this child is having, so if we see that, okay, this child is having uh, type 1 diabetes mellitus, all the other features are present. HbA1c is high, then RBS is high, GAD antibody is present. So we'll have to go for screening the autoimmune disease also, other autoimmune disease that the child might have celiac, which is remaining undiagnosed or hypothyroidism. Okay, so these are the investigation you will do for type 1 diabetes mellitus. Now, what is the treatment? So for treatment, first one is, it depends on the presentation of the child. We know that type 1 diabetes mellitus, child will either present with uh, polyuria, polydipsia, not severe, much severe symptoms, or he will present with DK, which is very severe. So if the child is presenting with DK, then we have to do the management of DK, that is with fluid and insulin. We'll see it the later uh, slides. But if the child is presenting with common symptoms, then what we will do? That is, child has come with polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, and there is uh, dehydration. Now, this is very important thing. We know that in most cases of diabetes, the child is usually obese. But that is not the case in case of type 1. Type 1 kids will always have this weight loss polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss. But type 2 child, they will always have some obesity, family history and everything. Okay. So the child has come to you with common presentations such as polyuria, polydipsia. So what you will do? You First, you will do lifestyle modification. That is, you'll tell them to have good diet, you know, do regular exercise. You'll try to involve the entire family. This is very important. Not only the child, he will not be encouraged enough to stick for a long time. So you will encourage mother, father to attend regular camping, and all that, all these camps and all the uh, workshops they, uh, they held for diabetes mellitus, you will try to encourage them to attend. Then education regarding the diet, exercise, blood glucose monitoring. So you have to educate the patient as well as the family about their diet, how much they should take, about the calorie counting, about regular exercise and how they should, they should uh, monitor the blood glucose. Next is you have to give a treatment, right? So you'll give subcutaneous insulin. So if you give sub, subcutaneous, you know, uh, for adult diabetes, we have to start with drugs. But in case of type 1 diabetes mellitus, we start with subcutaneous, subcutaneous insulin. Now you have to give it in basal bolus regimen. Now what is basal bolus regimen? By the word basal, basal means base. Base means there is basic, only one dose. 
okay so basal do bo bolus basal dose is usually fixed and it is usually given before bed and bolus means three times before meal so you have to bolus you know basal usually it is given in a large quantity usually a long acting insulin is given at bed time and then the bolus is given accordingly for example in the morning people eat less still give it less accordingly by counting your calorie and according to the meal in the uh, afternoon people eat a lot so you will count accordingly if you uh, have seen any doctor prescribing the insulin to anybody there will be a change in the dose of insulin for the morning and evening dose so that is the bolus so bolus the bo sorry so the basal is the fixed dose basal is fixed given once daily before bed and bolus is given three times after three times after correction and according to the mean correction means accordingly if your blood sugar is a lot so you will correct it if it is less then what you will do you will reduce the insulin that's what they mean okay so we are done with type 1 diabetes mellitus you guys have any doubt dr fatima do we need to know the value for the hpa1c uh, it is more than 6.5 okay that's it's more than okay. 6.5 okay let us move uh, i have a question how do we check uh, the ga antibody ga antibody there is a particular test for it uh, like we go, uh, go through the serum blood serum test sorry yes yes that is a blood uh, blood in the blood you'll test it in the blood okay right thanks okay Okay, now we learned that we are going to give the subcutaneous uh, subcutaneous insulin to the type one diabetic child, right? Now we need to have a basic idea about the mechanism of insulin. So let us see. So insulin, what does it do? It reduces the blood sugar, right? Now you want to know how does it reduce the blood sugar? It does not throw away the blood sugar. So what does it do to the glucose? What it does is it basically converts glucose into glycogen. first one is this second one is that it tries to prevent the new formation of glucose from other substances okay so it prevents glyco uh, gluconeogenesis gluconeogenesis means formation of glucose from non glucose substances also it prevents glycogenolysis and it will lead to increase formation of glycogen that is glycogenesis so this is how insulin will all lead to a uh, reduce blood glucose what insulin does is that insulin will shift the glucose into the cell so what it does after shifting the glucose after shifting the glucose it will lead to it will cause glycogenesis then it will cause some other adipogenesis and all this that means it will lead to using it will use up the glucose in some other work it will not let it stay in the blood blood itself okay now so insulin okay insulin in the skeletal muscle it increases glycogenesis that is glycogen formation increases the protein synthesis now why is uh, insulin being so nice to protein because if there is protein breakdown this will lead to gluconeogenesis so protein after breakdown of protein amino acids are produced so some amino acids help in glucose synthesis we don't want that so they are not trying to break down protein so they will increase protein synthesis now in the now in the liver in the liver insulin will increase the glycogenesis we know that the storage form of glucose in the liver and muscle is glycogen so in the insulin will convert the glucose into glycogen and increase glycogenesis so the blood glucose will reduce then we have will decrease gluconeogenesis that will it will reduce the formation of glucose from other substances such as a uh, fatty acid and protein in the adipose tissue it will increase adipogenesis that means it will increase the formation of adipose tissue because if adipose if fat is broken down that is going to lead into gluconeogenesis if there is gluconeogenesis the blood glucose will increase so insulin doesn't want that it will increase gluconeo adipogenesis it will decrease the lipolysis so this is the basic mechanism of insulin that you need to know okay this is really really important i learned this i think during my tas exam even during my fop exam i did not have a very clear idea about this and uh, this is like you will find this in a lot of recalls okay so you have to keep this in mind literally just you have to mug it up and practice 
next okay so we studied about insulin is given in type 1 then we studied about what is the mechanism of insulin now what are the types of insulin we know that this is a very basic question from our undergrad medical school so we have rapid acting insulin insulin lispro aspart glulicine short acting insulin atropid humulin s intermediate acting insulatard humulin i long acting insulin such as glargine datamid degrudec i think in last june session or october session there was one uh, question la, la, what is the name of the long acting insulin degludec this is the answer there were some other options given so you have to know the name of all this this is really important for the tas exam okay you have to know and it's uh, i hardly could find this everything in one page i think this first three options were there in the illustrated and the last one i got from some other book so this is really good you have to remember this okay now you studied that the child has diabetes mellitus type 1 you gave him the treatment you gave him insulin you know the mechanism of insulin you know the types of insulin which one you should give now the child is sick suddenly he is having some just he is normally sick he is having some upper respiratory tract infection or say some gastrointestinal infection so what will you do then okay so what will you do okay is everybody in the class uh, because somebody messaged me, mm, I don't know. See, if you leave the meeting, it will be very hard for me to again go back and check. How many people are there? Can somebody tell me? Participants. Yeah. How many? Sorry. There are eight participants, right? Oh. Everyone's okay. here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So sick day rules are that when the child is sick, that is uh, he's having some gastrointestinal infection or some any other kind of infection or disease, what will you do? How will you treat this child who is having type 1 diabetes and is sick now? Will you reduce the insulin? Because you might think, okay, he is sick. Maybe he needs less glucose or maybe he might uh, get into hypoglycemia. So you don't do that. There are certain things called sick day rules. So this is a PDF that I'll be supplying you. I think this is like seven or eight pages, but I have just uh, put the most important ones here. Okay. First, what are the recommendations for sick day rules is that never stop or omit the insulin. However, does may need to be reduced or increased and this will depend on the blood glucose and ketone levels. So even if the child is sick, you are not supposed to in omit the insulin or stop the insulin. Either you reduce the insulin or you increase the insulin based on the blood glucose level of the kid. Second one, check the blood glucose more frequently. That is every two hourly, including throughout the night. So, you know, this child is, uh, this sick children, they're very prone to hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. We have to be very sure and the sign and symptoms will be very difficult for us to distinguish between this. If the child is sick with type 1 diabetes mellitus, uh, he's also having type 1. So you will find it really hard to differentiate. The features may not be able to be uh, clear. So you have to keep checking the blood glucose levels, okay? Because the child may develop DKA that will cause hyperglycemia or child may develop hypoglycemia. So you have to keep checking the blood glucose every two hourly. Next one is that check for blood ketone level whenever the child is ill, regardless of blood glucose level. So you have to keep on checking the blood ketone level blood glucose level every two hours and never stop or omit the glucose. Give additional fast-acting insulin every two hours if the blood glucose is above target. If ketones are less than 0 0.6, then give the usual correction dose of insulin. So if the blood glucose is very high, so we have to use a fast-acting insulin instead of increasing the dose initially. So you might think, okay, there is uh, the blood glucose is really high. Let me increase the dose of insulin. No. You will give a fast-acting insulin and later on, if it is consistent, consistently hyperglycemia above the target, then you will go for increasing the insulin dose on a regular basis. First, you'll go for fast-acting insulin only. Okay. Up to here, we have finished type 1 diabetes mellitus. You guys have any doubt you want me to repeat? No? Hello? Am I audible? Yeah, I yes. think it's all clear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. No doubts? No. 
clear that's good that's great <laughs> let us move then okay dr shoaib can you follow nicely do you want me to explain he he is uh, actually from bangladesh he is my fellow bangladeshi so i am bit biased yeah, yeah. yeah i can hear it properly and i can understand properly okay. okay okay thank you if you have you guys everybody has any doubt you want me to repeat just go for it okay okay so we are done with type 1 diabetes mellitus we have studied sign and symptom what is the pathophysiology we studied the investigation what treatment you will give and the insulin mechanism of action types of insulin sig de rus we are done with type 1 now let's study type 2 diabetes mellitus now type 2 diabetes mellitus is very unusual you know unusual cause of diabetes in childhood there is a genetic predisposition to type 2 means that always the type 2 uh, diabetic ch child will always come with a family history that his father grandfather mother or somebody or the other will have diabetes so type 2 kids always they come with uh, obesity there will be features of obesity and they or they'll be overweight and plus there is a family history whereas type 1 they always come with weight loss polyuria and weight loss is important there okay so pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes mellitus there will be development of insulin resistance or sorry it means or here and defective insulin secretion so it could be due to two things maybe the beta cell of the pancreas 